I had to reread this volume twice. It's that damn good. It is that damn good. I reread this volume twice. This shit is in my top five, probably by far. I want to say this now, from what I've read from this volume. I, I personally believe that Berserk is by far, I think, my favorite manga I've ever read. This shit is too damn good. This is fucking what I look forward to when I read a manga. This is what I seek when I want something psychological, want something with a lot of deep meaning, symbolism, irony, so much in a manga. Something that has so much meaning in it. And such a good story. And dark plot. This shit is too good. Now I see why everybody was telling me to hurry up and review volume 12. I, like I said, I, I can't, I, I can't wrap my mind around how badass this volume is, and Berserk in general is. This volume proves to me how great Berserk really is, and how dark it can really get, and, I, and I'm not even done with the Eclipse. The Eclipse begins in this volume. And I knew what was coming since, you know, the first three volumes. I sensed it. I talked about it. discussed it. But you see what went down in this volume. It, it's so unsettling. It's so fucking dark. And the artwork, it is so disturbing. The artwork is very, very disturbing. It is so fucking disturbing because how dark it is. I, I think so far out of all the artwork I have seen from Berserk, this is the darkest I have seen so far. This is some dark fucking artwork. The backgrounds in this volume, when you see those faces come all over the walls when the clip starts, and you see all the demon humans coming in, oh my god, that was just too fucking scary. It was way too scary. When the introduction, when you see the god hand, the four god hand pop up in this volume, and they have their introductions and all that, I, it's like I vividly heard their voices in my mind, and I don't know what voice they were, but I was like, I was hearing like something in my mind when I was reading, I was like, damn, this is too fucking good, it was just dragging me in, my imagination was going too wild as I was reading this, it is so fucking good. And it's scary because of so much meaning in this. This is... I don't know how to describe and praise this volume. That is how damn good it is. Even if I said this was a masterpiece, which I'm, I'm really fucking close to saying this is a masterpiece. Next volume, depending on how it goes, I am probably going to declare this arc at the very least a fucking masterpiece. With all the underlying meaning that's been building up through this entire series. All that foreshadowing, everything, is just so fucking grand. And it makes so much sense. And just so much to happen in this volume is just scary. But what I will say is... If you're still on the fence and you're watching this review for the first time and you're a new cheater or whatever, new to Berserk, fucking read this. Fucking read this. This is... This shit. This shit is my favorite manga right now. This is my favorite. I am not denying. I'm not lying. I'm not sugarcoating it. This is my favorite so far. I just ordered volumes 14 through 20 tonight because after this volume, it was just too fucking damn good. Because I gotta know what's gonna happen. I know for a fact I'm gonna get to volume 13 it's gonna end on a fucking colossal cliffhanger and it's gonna make me pissed. I know for a fact it will. <sighs> when I started this series, when I started Berserk, I did not think it'd be this good. I, I heard rumors about it. I heard talk for many years I heard people, as I started reviewing this series, talk about the Golden Age arc and talk about the Eclipse volumes 12 and 13, telling me that it's just so, so fucking badass. I, I thought it was going to be good, but I didn't think it'd be this damn good. There's just so many questions I had from this volume. So many questions. So many things were revealed. So many things pop up that make me wonder why. And so much sadness, really. It's sad. I feel bad for Griffith and guts in everybody of the band of hawks because griffith though he kind of reveals his true nature in this volume he reveals that 
he can't look back now. He has come too far. He has piled up too many corpses. He cannot apologize no more. And he can't apologize anymore. Because if he was to try to repent and try to apologize, he would become a corpse on the road. The bloody path he has created himself. And to see the symbolism in the, the path, the corpses, oh my god. That shit is disturbing on so many different levels. So many different levels of how disturbing that pack of corpses were. And we find out some backstory to Griffith. We find out something that really makes me intrigued and, and I want to know who the fuck that is. That little kid that Griffith is running in the alleyway. Let's see if I can find it. There's this kid that Griffith runs in the alleyway with and supposedly... Here, right here. I'll show you. This kid supposedly is Griffith's friend in the past. And he supposedly died by an arrow shot to the chest, as I can see in this volume. I don't know technically how he died specifically, but I'm guessing it's Griffith's fault. And from what I could see from this boy's perspective, from what I saw, is that he wanted to be a knight serving underneath Griffith. And Griffith walked over, trampled over his friend's dream, someone he considered as a friend. And... It's so sad the way you see it like that. And another thing that pops up in this is the meaning that Guts has towards Griffith. Like how much meaning Griffith thinks that Guts has. Because Guts is the only person to ever, ever remove that dream Griffith stared up in the sky for. That kingdom he always looked, the dazzling kingdom. Guts was the only person to ever make Griffith forget his dream. And for Griffith to give up this person, to sacrifice this person, it shows you he has lost all humanity. Any possible thing he could possibly have as a human being has been lost. He cannot turn back. He has crossed the line when it comes to piling up corpses. This person, Guts, our main character, made Griffith forget his dream. And Griffith sacrifices him. The ultimate sacrifice. He gave up everybody. The band of hawks, everybody, has the mark. And now, there, I, I'm going to say Griffith no longer probably has any humanity left. To be able to do that to the people that has helped him get this far, it shows you he has no humanity left. And it's not just that. He wouldn't have made it this far in his life if it wasn't for those corpses, the people he trampled on. And it makes it so sad is because he continued to walk on these corpses with people that had no name, no children. They had wives, children, whatever. They had so many different things to look forward to, different dreams. And he continued on marching through this bloody path. And to see that demonstrated in this volume and see how it's executed, it's marvelous. It's fucking phenomenal. It's marvelous. I, I can't believe the emotions and atmosphere that is portrayed in this volume. Now, the question I want to bring up now, after reading this, is what the fuck is the law of casualty? It's brought up in this volume, and it's brought up in the past, I remember with the counts, like, you know, the, the invocation of doom or whatever, I think that's what it's called, and then, you know, you have the law of casualty. What the fuck is that? So, from what I can see in this series, Berserk, it has a lot of fate and destiny riding on its main plotline. Like, everything is predestined to happen. No matter what you do to change fate, it will happen. Like, we see this, like, I guess, little genie girl. Or I forget the name of it. And the, the girl that, you know, has a crystal ball, you know, looks for crystal balls to see everybody's future. Well, you see her look at Rickert's future... It says that, this, like, there's evil stars lining up around him, and there's one giant star uh, swirling around. And supposedly there's been a lot of Destiny talk brought up in Berserk. I've seen a lot of, you know, mention of fate and Destiny brought up, especially with the God Hand. So, is it possible that everything was predetermined? Like, nothing can be changed? Nothing at all? Nothing can be changed? So... I mean, is it possible that it can be? Like, the law of casualty, is it already predestined to happen? Like, let's say this law of casualty uh, is Griffith becoming the God Hand and people getting sacrificed. Is there any way to fight against this at all? Or is that impossible to fight against? And if it is possible to fight against, I'm going to probably say that 
Guts is the only person that's going to be able to do it. That's the only thing I want to say right now. I think he's the only person I think that can possibly fight the laws, the laws of casualty and fate and destiny if it goes this path what I am thinking. This is just me theory crafting from what I know. But, one thing though, I, I do want to bring up, okay? The Crips and Behelet. The only Behelet to give or turn someone into a god hand. The Crimson Behelot is given to someone that has the potential to be a god hand, or was already predestined, or already had those qualities to become a god hand, or the the king of king of longing. I think that's what it's called in the chapter. What Griffin was called. So, like I said, destiny is playing a big role in this series, and I wonder if there's any way to break that, or is there no way at all? That's very fucked up if, you know, everything's already predestined for the course of this series. But anyways, the final page in this volume has me really, really hyped to read the next volume. This. That. Zod and the Skeleton Knights are squaring off. It looks like they're fighting. Clearly what I can see, Rickard is looking at Zod and the Skeleton Knight fighting right here in this panel. And why? Why are these two fighting? That is the big ass question I have right now. Aren't they on the damn, like, same damn side? Aren't they both apostles of the God Hand? So, why are they fighting? Are one of them actually a good demon? Is one of them a bad demon? Is one of them actually going to try to save Guts? Because we know for a fact Guts makes it out of this eclipse. Because of volumes 1, 2, and 3. We know he makes it out. I don't know if anyone else makes it out. I'm willing to believe that everybody is going to fucking die. I want to say that right now. I believe everybody is going to die besides Guts. And Griffith, technically, since he's going to live on. I don't know about Rickard. I don't know if he's going to live or not. It depends on what's going to go on in the background since he's watching Zod and the Skeleton Knight fight. But either way, what I can say at this moment... Is, is the reason why Gut survives this battle, or what is going on the feast, the nocturnal feast, is because of either Zod or the Skeletonite? Is it one of them? Because, as I said, I highly doubt all demons are evil. I highly doubt all of them are. I highly doubt all of them have evil intentions. Or have, you know, bad attentions towards humans. Maybe they have evil attentions towards demons. And so, what if the Skeleton Knight, the reason why he helped out Guts at the beginning, like, of, you know, a couple volumes back, like, I think volume 7, and how he helped out Rickard last volume, is because he actually wants to help out humans, or he's a kind demon. That's what I want to say right now. Because that's the only reason why I can see this going on right now. Maybe Zod is stopping the Skeleton Knight from going in there to save or stop the festival or the, you know, the feast that is currently going on. And speaking of the feast, that was so fucking scary. I had, like, freaking shivers crawl up my spine and body when I saw that demon, the demon panel. When you see all those demons surrounding the band of hawks, oh my god. Those demons are so fucking creepy. I, I've never seen demons that fucking scary in a manga. That was on so many different levels of fucked up, scary, disturbing, and just like... Like, yeah, that. I definitely cannot recommend this series for anyone that's under 18 or not mature enough. This series is super fucking mature, but if you pay attention to all... The foreshadowing, the symbolism, the irony, so much development. You'll see something that is as close to perfection as possible. This is so fucking good. This is so damn good. I'm just amazed by how someone can write such a great work of art. The, the, art, the art and the writing in of itself. Oh my god. The, 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 like, the art tells a story. The writing tells a story. I'm scared to find out what the artwork and the writing looks like later on in Berserk. Like, I think there's 36 volumes of Berserk right now. I'm so scared to see what the writing of Berserk is. I, I'm willing to bet it gets so much fucking darker. Because this is just, like, the beginning of Berserk. And you see this? I'm 
My mind is blown. My mind is really blown after this volume. You know what? I'm gonna have to process this. I'm gonna have to just yeah. I, I I can't. I gotta think about this. I might have to reread this volume again to just completely grasp the epic shit I am reading right now. This is gold in paper. This is gold. Tell me your thoughts on this volume. I'm sorry I didn't go in-depth review of this volume. I'm just too damn shocked about this. Tell me your thoughts in the comments below about volume 12 of Berserk. I've been told to do a live reaction of Berserk on volume 13. I'm thinking of doing one, a live reading. If I am going to do one, it's going to be just like my Tokyo Ghoul, you know, finale live reaction I did, you know, a week or two back. So, that's exactly what my, you know, live reaction to the manga will be, and most likely I will have either an afterthought review after I read it, or I'll make a separate video that will be a review on the volume. But, either way, 15 out of over 10, like, you know, 15 out of 10, I mean, that that's just how fucking good it is, it, it's way over 10 out of 10, it's 15 out of 10, or 20 out of 10, and I'm not fucking exaggerating, that is the, how good this is. So, you have a wonderful day or not, wherever you live. I'm going to go process this in my mind. Have a wonderful day or not. Chibi out.